Good morning. I'm over here. On this side, good to see you, Randy. To get it out of the way, to get it out of the way, if you notice, I had an encounter with a sidewalk. The sidewalk won. But it's no big deal. I'm just letting you know because so if everybody's going to ask me individually, it takes a long time. So I'm well, thank you. Uh, the sidewalk is doing better than I was. Um, but the uh, doctor says no big deal. So it's going to happen. But uh, like somebody says, it's, it, it's heck to be a granddad, right? How was Christmas? Good, 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 good. You know that the overwhelming message of Christmas story is that is the assurance that we are children of the Holy One. In this, our very presence is a gift we will only allow the Spirit to move in and through us. Every day of our ordinary lives, we can show up and be present and proclaim the assurance of hope, the assurance of peace, the assurance of joy, the assurance of love, and the assurance that God cares for us. Amen? We have our wreath lit, our, our Advent wreath lit again. We remind ourselves, what can we give? What can I give for as I am? So let's sing it once, and after that, they will lead us into the call to worship.
The gift of hope is an essential survival tool because it reminds us that the hard times do not have the last word. The gift of Christ, peace, reminds us that we can have peace even in the midst of non-peaceful situations. The gift of joy is not the equivalent of happiness, but rather the deep call to delight in the small things. The gift of love is the clarion call to us as Jesus' disciples. The more love we put into the world, the better the world will be. The gift of Christ light is the reassurance that we are never alone. We light, light these, these candles, candles as a, as a sign, sign that we will, that will be, be present, present with assurance in, in the world. world. seated. The scripture today is from Isaiah 62 verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Zion's glory and a new name. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent and for Jerusalem's sake I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like a brightness, and her salvation like a torch that is burning. The nations will see your righteousness, and all kings your glory, and you will be called by a new name, 
which the mouth of the Lord will designate. You will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal headband in the hand of your God. The word of the Lord. We'll join together for a moment of confession. God of light and darkness, we have seen the glimmer of your starlight beckoning to us, but we have turned away and followed other paths. We confess that we have not loved you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, Holy One. Strengthen our faltering steps and guide us in your holy way of peace. Amen. Have a moment of reflection, please. Amen. I think I mentioned several times during the holiday season that the real reason why we celebrate Christmas it was because there is and there was a resurrection. In the early, early church, Christmas didn't exist. Actually, in the early church, Sunday was always an Easter celebration. And that's why Christians gather on the first day of the week in commemoration of the day in which Jesus rose from the dead. So if Jesus was the gift from God to us in salvation, what does that mean? So I invite you to remind ourselves of our assurance of salvation as we together confess what Christ has given us as that gift of salvation. So together we're able, let's repeat it. In Christ we are loved, we are saved and we are redeemed. In Christ we are rescued. We are together and hope filled. In Christ we are made new and forgiven. Thanks be to God. So if you're able, let's stand together and sing our Gloria, which is, oh, how is that, is that it? Oh. Huh.
been here on Christmas Eve morning. We had the breakfast. We had a wonderful attendance. There was food for almost everybody in town. And I found a conga drum. I guess it was somebody brought it for the yard sale. It didn't sell. So I claimed it. And there's somebody who took a video of me playing the conga. I look so good. Thank you. When I was a youth in church, that was the instrument that I played in the band. I was Ricky, Ricardo. Tu, tu, tu. <laughs> so therefore, since we are forgiven, the peace of the Lord is with you. Awesome. Share it with one another this morning. <laughs> peace be with you. Thank you so much. Let's continue our worship and adoration of our Lord Jesus Christ who has come to live and is with us as we sing together, Go Tell It on the Mountain.
Sometimes I like to listen to the music without the words. The words are good, but I, I listen to the song and I'm remembering of the words, particularly when it said, um, God with us revealed in us. What? Have you pondered about that one? Well, interestingly enough, that's what we've been working with all month. God with us revealed in us. That's the gift of presence of God in our lives. So I'm going to continue and finish to their series that's called uh, Being the Gift of Presence. And next month or next Sunday, we begin a series uh, that is called God is Holding Your Life. Huh. God is holding your life. I thought that would be a wonderful series to start with a new year, particularly a new year that many of us, let's be honest, I hope to be around by next Christmas, but if I keep walking like I'm walking, you know, who knows? <laughs> but God is holding our lives in God's own hands. So that's what we'll begin next week. But today I want to talk about the gift of, being, uh, the gift of assurance. We have that beautiful song, Blessed Assurance. We will be singing at the end of the worship service. But let me read the scriptures today from uh, Matthew chapter 2. And I'm beginning at the end of the chapter because it's a little story that some of us kind of don't bring into our Advent or Christmas season. But it's a story that tells us of assurance, of being present, of how God is present in assuring perhaps this one individual this one individual had a promise. Listen to and for the word of the Lord. At this time, a man named Simeon was living in Jerusalem. Simeon was a good man. He loved God and was waiting for God to save the people of Israel. God's spirit came to him and told him that he would not die until he had seen Christ the Lord. Hmm. When Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to do what the law of Moses says should be done within the baby, the Spirit told Simeon, go to the temple. Simeon took the baby Jesus in his arms and praised God, saying, Lord, I am your servant, and now I can die in peace because you have kept your promises to me. With my own eyes, I have seen what you have done to save your people, and foreign nations will also see this. Your mighty power is a light for all nations, and it will bring honor to all the peoples in your kingdom. The word of the Lord. As I shared, we're in this journey called the gift of being present, where we found out that we are the best present to one another. Let me ask you to do that. Look to each other and say, I am your present, guys. Can you believe that? Tell somebody else and scare them. I am your present. <laughs> scare them that way. <laughs> so in this, in this search, we, 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 we've discovered the very presence of God in one another. We have discovered the presence of hope in us empowering us to believe that things can change for the best. We have been given the gift of peace, making God, I mean, God making and empowering us to be peacemakers and then be called children of God. We have received the gift of joy, empowering us to accomplish anything despite circumstances because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And just last Sunday morning, we saw the gift of love a powerful love from God deposited, poured in our hearts, and sent to dwell in us. A love that is insisting on, on us, over us, for us, so that we may have the power to make good decisions as we love others God's way. We come to a close of our current teaching series, and I would like to share a little bit about being present with the gift of assurance. The gift of assurance, I, I, I look it up, and, and every time I looked up assurance, uh, assurance insurance came up. So I have to look on, you have to refine your look, your search, and you get assurance from God. Scripture is full of verses of assuring us of God's faithfulness, God's presence. But assurance 
is commonly known to be a positive declaration intended to give you confidence. A positive declaration intended to give you money, uh, <laughs> to give you confidence. It's there. We hear all the time, money back guarantee, right? And it makes you feel more confident to pick up that phone or do that, push that button. Or get in the car and go shopping. Who does that these days? But that's what assurance seems to be. When you're in the phone and you get one of these beautiful, beloved customer service guys or ladies, they put music on you. And then once in a while, to give you assurance that eventually you will be speaking with a human being, they tell you, we'll be right back. We'll be right back. Or the great one that we love, you know, that, that young people are using or they use for a while there. So don't worry, be happy. That's assurance. A positive declaration in order to build confidence. When you're buying a house, Oh, this house has a future ahead of it. It was built in the 60s, you know. So we play with that assurance, with those promises, those guarantees, a pledge, a vow, perhaps a commitment. But assurance should lead us to a degree of confidence, to a degree of peace, to a degree of patience, perhaps. Uh, until the market crashes or we have catastrophic incidents and children run in front of you and you try to misstep them and then your eye sees the road. Things can go sour and things can go south. That's our kind of assurance. Actually, we don't believe it. We don't believe in assurance in the world. So you know what we do? We get insurance. Think about it. That's what we do. They tell us that things are going to be okay, that you have a guarantee here, and yet we still buy insurance against the guarantee because we deep down Deep, deep down, we doubt. We have that sense of, hmm, seated doubts and a sense of uncertainty. It doesn't leave us alone. We check, we confirm, and reconfirm. Now, I know I can, you guys can relate to this. How many times, perhaps, maybe 20 years ago, or you around 20 years ago, you would have to call the airline and confirm your flight. You remember doing that? How many of you, now let's be honest, how many of you did it three times? A week before, two days before, and the night before, right? When you got to the airport, was your name on the list? You better reconfirm, re, re, reconfirm, because deep down, we don't trust. Deep down, we have that sense that uh, it is very fragile. This assurance between human beings is very tenuous. It, it, it's just not what is talked about. So God has always been bringing the contrast or the more excellent of those qualities. We speak about hope, but God's hope is very different. We speak about peace, but God's kind of peace is very different. We speak about joy, but God's kind of joy, it goes beyond gladness and is something very different. We speak about love, and God's love is very different. Sometimes we don't even like it because it makes us, compels us to love the unlovable. So God's kind of assurance is not like the assurance that we find in the world. It is the kind of assurance that is not broken, God's kind of assurance is like a steady rock, unmovable, unbending, secured, and sealed. We sing it when we sing Rock of Ages or when we sing How Firm a Foundation. The name of the Lord says the, uh, uh, the Proverbs, the name of the Lord is a strong fortress. Wow. Remember the hymn? A mighty fortress is our God. So the Old Testament is filled with images that tells us of God's faithfulness, of God's assurance that what God says, God will do, just like it happened to Simeon in our scripture this morning. 
You see, Simeon could have gone and, and continued to be an older retired person in the temple, by the way. Following the story of Simeon, there's a very short story about a prophetess called Anna. Again, one of those little stories that kind of becomes obscure in Scripture. But Anna is contrasted. It's actually kind of the both stories of Simeon and Anna, and both are older people. It was common that in those days, retirement was not in Sun City Center. Retirement was around the temple if you had influence and you had somebody somewhere in the temple, you would remain in the temple. Because the people who visited the temple, they were supposed to give three offerings. The offering to the temple, the prepare, some kind of other offering, I can't remember the name, can't pronounce it. But then, there was the requirement and expectations that you would give alms to the needy. And because that was the part of worship, the needy people were there. They knew that if they went to the temple, they would receive help. Now, some of us don't like to receive help for nothing, right? Our pride is a little bit touched, you know. And, but some of these people, they've gone over it so many times, they swallow their pride. So as they are begging, they're also offering blessings. That was the exchange in those days. You give me an alm. I'll give you a blessing. So that was happening in those days. Simeon gets caught up in that, and, 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 and he's aware that God's promises are faithful. So God's kind of assurance is a steady one. Moses calls it, the Lord is the rock. His works are perfect. Oh, my goodness. And all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright, and just is the Lord. Is that statement sound good or it just sounds good or it makes you feel good or it gives you a good standing? Because the, the challenge that we have, that Simeon had, that Anna had, and that both Mary, Joseph, even the shepherds had, and I'm going to also include the wise people that went to visit, was that they had a choice to believe God, or not to. Again, it is not about believing in God. It's about believing God. That what God says is enough for me to rest, to recline, to rest, to have peace, to have joy. That assurance that is immovable. That assurance that is comes from a God whose promises are perfect. Jesus became actually the, the, the object, if I can use that word, the demonstration, the evidence, the, 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 the proof of God's assurance. Because Jesus was behaving in a way that the leaders of the temple did not understand. And they were the priests and ministers. They were the Presbyterians, the scholars and everything, and we didn't get them. Because he was being and behaving like God, not like the law. He was walking in the understanding of the Spirit and not in the law. Notice that in Simeon's life, who moves Simeon to believe that he's not going to die until he sees the salvation of Israel? The Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God becomes the main character in the story. In this portion, the Spirit of God guides him to the temple. The Spirit of God assures him of a promise. And the Spirit of God reminds me, hey, guy, go to the temple. Your promise is there. So he was not a mystic, perhaps, but he had an understanding on how the Spirit moves in and around his own life. And so did Anna. Jesus himself becomes God's assurance, his deeds, his words. Listen to what something he said. The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Now, when the, the thing here is when you, we hear the word eternal life, we have to stop our tendency to think eternal life after we die. Eternal life begins when we encounter God and God encounters us. 
So the fulfillment of your eternal life is when we go in the hole. And you're in God's presence. So the Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human efforts accomplishes nothing. And the very words Jesus says, I have spoken to you, are spirit and life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was the light of the world. And this light came down and became the life of all people. So Jesus himself is the assurance of God. Jesus is our assurance, but when, he, when the right time came, Paul reminds us, God sent God's son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that we could be adopted as his own, own children. I began saying this morning that the overwhelming reality, the overwhelming encompassing reality of this whole story of Christmas is that we are part of the story. That the story takes place because of you and me. That's why the story takes place. Because of you and because of me. So we are implicitly part of the story. We are bought and paid into freedom. We are assured a relationship with God. We are the children of God. Now, uh, uh, we don't feel that way all the time. And, and I don't feel like a children of God when I use the metaphor, and the dove flew away. That means that I didn't answer properly anything that happened. The Spirit of God flies away sometimes from me. Get scared. No. But by the blood and sealed by the Spirit, becoming children of God. And this is love. Not that we love God, John says, but that God loved us first. So who got you out of the dumpster? Did you get yourself out of the dumpster? In that old women's Bible study that, they, that, that you ladies had? No, God lifted you out of the dumpster because this is love. That God loved us first. See, every day of our ordinary lives, we can show up and be present and proclaim the assurance of hope, proclaim the certainty of peace, proclaim the promise of joy and the availability of love to those who need it most. We are the gifts of hope, assuring a message that things can change for the better. We are the gift of peace to our community and families as we labor to bring justice and become peacemakers. We are the gift of joy to one another as we walk through the darkness knowing that they are temporary. And we know that darkness does not win because joy comes with the morning. We are the gift of love as we proclaim the unconditional love that all who comes to Jesus, that all are welcome in that love that breaks through and compels us. We are the gift of light to a community, to a people in darkness. You know that the biggest problem with the darkness is not the darkness. Uh, on Christmas Eve in the evening, I was saying that the scripture of John 1, 5, and the, and the light came, but the darkness could not comprehend the light. It doesn't tell us to destroy light. And nowhere in the scripture it tells us that we are to fight the light. We are to go through it. Because the one who, who, who conquered the light, the darkness, was Jesus for us. And the biggest problem, as Amy Ogden, our teacher from the book said, is not the darkness, is that we, for some reason, cannot see through the darkness. But with the light of Christ, even in the darkness, we can experience that hope. Even in that darkness, we can experience that peace. Even in the darkness, we can experience that joy. Even in darkness, we can experience God's love. Because all those gifts were given to us to reassure us that we are the children of God. This is the assurance we share. I am sure. Other version says, I am convinced. Another version actually says, I'm assured. Another version says, I have no doubt that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not life or death, not angels or spirits, I'm going to add, not a fall in the ground or a heart attack or our memory loss, none of that can separate us 
from the love of God. Not the present, not the future can separate us from the love of God. Not the powers above or the powers below. I like this one. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love who is in the greatest gift of all, our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. If you join me, let's go ahead and, and pray together as we close this part of our worship. Let's pray. Holy and living God, you are reassuring presence. Let this assurance grow in our lives each day so we can be present of assurance to others. Unwrap and open our hearts. May it be so. Amen and amen. I was going to give you a quiz on this series, but I forgot to tell you. But maybe I can ask the questions. We have one minute. What word, what phrase throughout the whole season jumps in your heart, brings you a smile, sparks in your eye? A couple of you. Huh? Peace. What other word brings up, spin, bubbling in your heart as you heard the word today? Love. Return. Very good. Thank you so much. And because we, we, we are loved and because we're called by God and because we are assured that we are the children of God, we can pray. And our prayers are heard. And our prayers are answered in ways that we don't even know. Uh, uh, Peggy was telling me just uh, she had a, mo a God moment uh, earlier in the season. Who likes to be unemployed during Christmas time? It happened to her son. So mom started to pray. I think God has a little concern when mothers begin to pray. And she told God what she wanted, when she wanted it. And God was faithful, right? There you go. I had that experience. I one day asked God for a job to start on such a date, earning this much money, and I got it. A week into the job, I hated it. <laughs> and I know it was God's gift. So I had to swallow it up and said, Lord, give me some love for this thing. And God turned it around. And it was a good period of my life there, after all. So let us pray for what's coming what is happening, and let's bring all those concerns to the throne of grace. But let's also bring the joys before God's throne. And we thank you, Lord, that in your presence we find fullness of joy. That in your presence we can find that space away from a world of swirling and chaos to a world of order and peace with you. Make us aware of that special place with you every day. Make us aware that we can even share this holy space with others. Lord, as we close this year tonight, we pray for the next year. But we give you thanks for this year. We give you thanks for new friends. We give you thanks for smiles. We give you thanks for challenges that brought us closer to you. We give you thanks for the love you shared with us throughout this year. We give you thanks for the love you shared with our families. We look forward and, and we know because of our past experience that you are a faithful God and that you assured us that no matter what happens, <laughs> as we read, nothing can separate us from the love of God. But we got to believe that. We gotta be assured that your word is not negotiable, not debatable, because you chose to love us first. And we have no choice but to love you. Easily or with difficulty, you still love us. We pray for our country this coming year. The uncertainties of a very violent election, language is used. But we pray that we don't get caught up in those idols of this world. That we seek the assurance of your peace. That we realize the dreams of America of a
place where all are welcome and all are given the opportunity to move forward and contribute in many ways. The lions are worried, they don't want that. But we know that whatever happens, we are under your care. And you are sure as that because our lives is in your hands as we're going to learn next month. Lord, we pray for those of our friends of church and family who are sick, those who are traveling this week, those who are at home watching us. Bless them. May your hand of compassion and truth and joy be in their lives. But above all, we give you thanks, O oh God, for the Lord that has been faithful to us year after year after year and who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day and forgive our And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now look at the person next to you and says, I want to take my gift back. <laughs> I shared on, on Christmas morning here that uh, the day before, we exchanged gifts with my grandson and my granddaughter from, from North Carolina. They were here. And we told them that Santa does not come to Graham's house. They go to his house. We're lying. <laughs> my daughter doesn't like that. But we exchanged gifts. And then my, my, my granddaughter, who apparently is going to be a musician, when she opened her gift, she shouted. The one and a half. She recognized it. And then the, the mom says, oh, that's her favorite instrument in preschool. Good, Grandpa. Hit it right on the dot. The grandson had issues with his car because his car's battery were not working. So the next morning he said, Gramps, I don't want that gift anymore. And dad said, I'm going to fix it. Apologize to Gramps. How are you, Gramps? But it's so good to see that. How many of you had those memories of children opening that gift? Wasn't it nice, especially in our culture where we have passivity? Always a passivity, a manger seen by the Christmas tree. It was so much fun to see my one-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter playing with the figurines and breaking the head of a shepherd. <laughs> That's the idea. That's how they play with the figures of the story of God's gift to us. So let's go ahead and give unto the Lord with generosity and respond to God with grace and generosity. Thank you.
guys, we have this issue with clapping. And to be honest, I think it's a cultural thing. <coughs> it is. Um, the way some other cultures express joy, they have more freedom. You guys don't. <laughs> just kidding. No, but, but it's a cultural thing, and that's okay. Uh, I'm just going to try to make you more Scottish so you can... No. <laughs> Looking at Emily there. Or perhaps more, more human and be able to express... You know what it is? We're afraid of expressing emotions because we don't trust them. Yet God has given them to us. Of course, if we get up, then we call the hospital, then we take you away. <laughs> Let us give God the glory and sing the doxology as we stand together. Our prayer of dedication. God of wonder, we offer you these humble gifts, signs of your goodness and mercy. Receive them with our gratitude, that through us all people may know the riches of your love in the word made flesh. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I want to remind you that um, as we close the year, we thank God for all of your generosity, not only in your time and talents and, and finances, we thank you for that. Now, we do have a system of pledging in our, in, in our Presbyterian way, where you give us a pledge and then I send the Nazis after you, if you don't pay it. <laughs> no, uh, that never happens. Uh, it's a promise that you make before the Lord, and if you're able to fulfill it, fine. If you're not, it's fine. God will always provide. So uh, there are some of those new envelopes, if you haven't made a pledge, you're welcome to do it. There are blank envelopes. You have to touch them. You know there's something inside. In the table right to my left there to be able to do that. Now, next Sunday is the first Sunday of the year, and we're going to dedicate ourselves next year during the communion worship and also our service to the Lord. So you're welcome to come. Invite a friend as we celebrate the new year. We'll celebrate Epiphany, and we'll begin our series, God, the God is holy in your life. It'll be good. Uh, announcements, please. Uh, here you go. Okay, yep. Um, uh, it's almost uh, time for the directory photographs. We have about 15 slots open for the um, end of January. But we also do uh, March uh, 4th, if you can't make it, you know, at that time or uh, you're away or whatever. You also don't have to be a member of the church. You know, you're attending, uh, if your neighbor, you wanna bring a neighbor to, uh, it's a free service, you'll get an eight by 10 of that. And uh, we do wanna make sure that everybody uh, in the directory is recognized because a lot of people use So what I gotta do is that you don't have to be a member of this church to be in the directory? That's right. I like that. Yeah. So it's, but it's, eventually we'll make them members by common law. Well, <laughs> so um, I'm going to be in the back. Uh, Danny helps me too, signing up. Again, we have about 15 slots open. And, um, you know, we need to fill those up uh, pretty quickly because in four weeks we'll be doing it. Click, Thank you. Click, click. Grant? Grant, you're wearing a suit today. What happened? Where are you going? Oh, uh, I'm going out to the atrium, and I'm going to sell tickets to the team. Oh, there tea. you go. Very good. Uh, very good. Good surprise. Uh, yeah, we're, we're expecting a pretty large crowd, and uh, there are reserved. If you buy enough tickets, you can reserve a table. Uh, and if you have any extra teapots you'd like to donate, we may need them. I think that's all I have. Do I have to make flans? You have to make flans. How many? I, I need 150 scones, so I don't know what God. you're doing. <laughs> you know, I use shot glasses for those blondes, right? Thank you so much. 
Uh, the announcements are also in your, in your worship guide. The newsletter is available for you to get one. There's one out there. You'll be getting it online soon, right? Uh, mostly on Tuesday. But uh, go ahead and become familiarized with the life of the church. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn, which is Blessed Assurance. second filled with his goodness lost in his love wow. dwell with that one for a little while this afternoon filled with his goodness lost in his love that is the whole thing we've been talking about that's my god moment today the whole series i i i, waste, I spoke a lot i could have just said filled with his goodness lost in his love so people of god People who God has poured Jesus Christ and all God's goodness in you. Be filled, be saturated, be overwhelmed so that your cup floweth over and spread it to others this coming year as we become the gift for this community. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much, and you may sit and enjoy the post loop. <laughs>